In this lesson, we will consider the concept or the principle behind separation of powers. Now, very simply, we can consider it as the three arms of government or the three powers of government operating independently of one another so that the rights and liberties of individuals are preserved. The whole notion of separation of powers is that the collective amalgamation of power of state must not be vested in one person or a single group of individuals. Thus, the principle goes as the powers should not be vested in one person due to individuals' prejudices and biases. But what must be noted more importantly in a contemporary context is that today, in the modern iteration of separation of powers, it is more likely to be considered, or it is more prudent rather, to be considered as the independence of the judiciary. Because we see overlaps between the legislature as well as the executive, the judiciary, on the other hand, is considered to be paramount in terms of independence, and therefore it must be set completely aside from the two remaining arms of government, that being executive and the legislature. Now, before we proceed, Let's consider the composition of the executive, the legislature, as well as the judiciary. On the one hand, specifically in considering the UK, the executive is made up of the crown or the queen, the monarchy, as well as central government. Now, the central government is composed primarily of the prime minister, who is the head of state, as well as the cabinet of ministers. On the other hand, the legislature or the body that has the power to make laws, is made up, once again, of the Crown, the House of Commons, and the House of Lords. It's a distinctive point that the UK has a bicameral parliament, which is made up of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now, it's interesting to note that the legislature is actually made up of these three parts based on three different notions, or three different pillars of reasonings. On the one hand, the Crown, or the Queen, is part of the legislature by convention. The House of Commons is an elected body, and the House of Lords is an unelected, appointed body. Thirdly, you have what I consider as one of the most important arms of state, which is the judiciary, and in the context of separation of powers, of distinct importance. The judiciary is made up of all the judges in courts of law and the lay magistrates. Now, at this juncture, it's important to retrospectively look at the Lord Chancellor, something that I briefly touched on in the topic of the Constitution earlier. The Lord Chancellor was one of the few individuals or officials in the government or state who actually had a position in the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. And therefore, he came under a lot of criticism. The position of Lord Chancellor came under a lot of criticism for not adhering to the principles of separation of powers. For instance, as I noted earlier, the contemporary notion of separation of powers deals with the independence of the judiciary and that it is separate from the executive and legislature, which in itself can have certain overlaps occurring. But the Lord Chancellor, before the actual position was removed, was, for instance, the Speaker of the House of Lords, therefore being the head of the legislature. He was also the head of the judiciary. Therefore, there was a clear encroachment on the independence of the judiciary. Now, it's important to note that the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 actually reformed the post of the Lord Chancellor and was replaced uh, in the judiciary by the Lord Chief Justice. And now, following the Supreme Court Act of 2009, the House of Lords is no longer the apex judicial body in the country. It is now the Supreme Court of the UK. Now that we've had a brief overview of the principle and the concept of separation of powers, let's have a quick summary overview of what we discuss as well as what you can take forward into your next topics. So as the main premise or the foundation of the topic, you have the three divisions of state, which is legislature, judiciary and the executive. Now, there are various conventions which are in effect, much like those constitutional conventions that we discussed in the earlier topic. There are notable connections or notable relationships which are there between the legislature as well as the judiciary, as well as the executive and the legislature. For instance, between the legislature and the judiciary, there is a convention to note that 
there must be no criticism of the judiciary by parliament. In terms of the executive and the legislature, there is ministerial responsibility, something we briefly touched on in the previous topic. According to Barnett, separation of powers is a relative and amendable concept. What this means is, you can either have completely no separation of powers, which means it's a completely fused infrastructure. You can have full separation of powers where each body is completely independent of one another, which might not also be the best scenario. And you might have a weak separation of powers, something similar to the position of the Lord Chancellor at one point in the UK. Now, the very notion that the separation of powers deals with the independence of the judiciary as well as the three arms of state acting independently from each other means that in order for the state to run, in order for the machinery to be active, there must be certain relationships and certain regulations that operate either by way of law or by way of constitutional conventions. So firstly, let's consider the relationships that are prevalent between the legislature and the judiciary. Vauxhall notes that the judiciary must give effect to the intent of parliament. Having a look at Pickens and British Railway Board, we note that there can't be any questioning of a validity of an act of parliament in terms of the judiciary. Have a look at Pickens in the case summaries for a more in-depth analysis of the case as well as how you can actually implement it in your answers to problem questions or theory questions that come up during examination situations. On the other hand, we have the relationship between the executive and the judiciary. Firstly, there is judicial review of executive orders or executive decisions. And you have the distinct portion of constitutional law which relates to the royal prerogative, something we will look at in depth a bit later on in this course. But for the purposes of this lesson, I urge you to have a look at the infamous GCHQ case, again available in your case summaries. The enforcement of the relationship between the executive and the legislature, thirdly, is taken care of by question time and debates in parliament. This is where the government and the government in waiting or the opposition hash it out in parliament and the relationship is sustained between the executive and the legislature. It is important to note that these relationships are manifested in such a manner so as to create that demarcation between the executive legislature and the judiciary while keeping the fused infrastructure or a relative connection between the three arms of state so as the country can progress and operate efficiently. Now, I've noted on several occasions that the contemporary notion of separation of powers primarily deals with the independence of the judiciary. There are three main aspects that determine whether there is an independent judiciary. Firstly, you have the aspect of bias. Have a look at dimes in your case summaries for an in-depth analysis on bias and how it affects the independence of the judiciary. Also, in order to make sure that judges are not influenced as well as the independence of the judiciary is sustained, there must be security of tenure something that has been enforced and granted by the Act of Settlement in 1700. Also, finally, in order to create the notion as well as actual judicial independence, there must be immunity for judges from suit in either a court of law or in parliament or any other executive order. Therefore, if you consider Siros, another case available in your case summaries, you'll be able to identify how judicial independence has been sustained. There have been much commentary on the concept or the principles of separation of powers. Lord Diplock has noted that separation of powers can be considered as parliament making law and the judiciary interpreting it. That's one of the simplest ways of actually identifying the concept or the notion of separation of powers. On the other hand, Montesquieu has noted that there is a clear demarcation between the arms of state. The independence of the judiciary as a contemporary context also is aligned with this particular notion of Montesquieu's. That was a brief summarized overview of separation of powers. This particular topic is important throughout your course of study of any LLB degree program in constitutional law or public law as it keeps coming up in many other areas of the subject matter as well. Also, 
when you progress in your LLB program and take on subjects like jurisprudence or administrative law, this comes in quite handy as a foundation, being the entire subject of constitutional law as well as this specific topic of separation of powers. In the next lesson, we will consider a very pivotal and a specialized aspect of constitutional law unique to the United Kingdom, which is the royal prerogative.